Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the uh, Engineers and Architects meeting. Uh, we're the club that's been meeting continuously since around the turn of the century. So <laughs> a lot of history here, and we're going to learn some more today about uh, an interesting topic. Um, before I do anything, though, I need to uh, solicit a humor from the crowd. If there's a, a joke out there, I'd like to... I think we got one here. This is out of the current issue of The Economist magazine. Uh, in India, the governor of the state of, of Andhra Pradesh, Mr. N.D. Tawari, resigned after a television news program, ran a, ran a video showing him, showing, purporting to show him having sex in the company of three young ladies. He's 84 years old. If nobody thinks that's funny, it's because you're not 84 years old like I am. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And I know we have uh, one announcement. Here you go. Yeah, I'd like to mention that the um, Houston Council or Honolulu Council of Engineering Societies, HCES, is working on the Engineers Week stuff, which is February 14th through the 20th. The um, banquet, which we've gotten the speaker for, it's going to be Paul Brubaker, is on the 20th. I was talking to Sam earlier, and we're going to reserve a table for EAH there. I don't think it'll cost us anything to say we want a table for our membership. We would ask that you uh, get your tickets separately and go through. I put a copy of the Wheeliki on each of the main tables. The new Wheeliki just came out last week. and. Basically, it's $40 for um, the banquet per person, $50 after February the 9th. If you're interested in the kickoff luncheon, it is on the Tuesday rather than the Saturday at lunchtime, and I think it's $30. Both events are being held at the Holicoa Hotel. The banquet will be held at the Luau Garden outside, and the, I don't know where the... Uh, the kickoff luncheon is, but wanted to make you aware of that. Also, anybody who's interested or any companies that are interested in sponsorships and things, we're down to the wire on that, and uh, again, there's information in the WeLeaky, and the engineers would like to get lots of advertising out to the public so that they recognize what all those engineers do. Yes, at the uh, banquet, it's Paul Brubaker, right. who's going to be talking about the recession and stuff, and it's the uh, dean of the engineering school, Peter Crouch, who's going to be speaking at the luncheon. Thank you. And before we get going with today's program, I just want to give you guys a preview of what's, what's to come. Uh, January 15th is a uh, Martin Luther King holiday, so there's no meeting. January 22nd, we have Naki Wilson talking about energy. Uh, January 29th, uh, Kirsten Faulkner uh, is going to be talking about the uh, Waikiki Natatorium. Uh, moving on to February, February 5th, we've got Captain Will Boudra um, talking about revitalizing military neighborhoods. February 12th is a holiday. February 19th, uh, Bill Ritter. Riddle is going to talk about a book he just published, and February 26th, uh, Bill Leary is going to talk about sailing in Hawaiian waters, and in March, Ardalan is going to line up some cool stuff for us too. So um, moving on to today's speaker, we have our uh, esteemed <laughs> EAH member that you all know, um, Mr. Alan Lloyd. He's a graduate of Punahou School, uh, Swarthmore College. Um, he's an engineer, pilot, historian, all around interesting guy. So uh, I'm sure his talk will be great. So uh, I'll hand it over to our presenter. Um, here you go. To get me on early, so I'll give you a quick run view of the whole program then. That uh, the hobby now is lecturing on cruise liners. And so generally they're looking for about a 40 minute program. So I took my Spanish navigation and stretched it a little by packing on a Polynesian navigation uh, early on. Whoops, let me go back and start here with a map. This is, of course, the famous Polynesian Triangle, which is bounded by New Zealand, Hawaii, and uh, uh, Easter Island. 
And basically it seems that the Polynesian types worked their way across the Pacific and got launched in Samoa, per se. Now the one thing that I have really dawned on me recently is the Hawaiian Islands are geographically far much larger than any of the other the islands in this area, New Zealand being the obvious exception. And I gather what would happen, these guys are pretty prolific, and the population pressures on some of these small islands, like the, the island of Tahiti is only 388 square miles, where Maui is 726 for, by comparison, and the big island 4,000. And uh, so they were starting to fight each other for access to food and valleys, and so somebody got the bright idea, well, let's emigrate. So I think population pressure on small islands stimulated the uh, gradual movement of this ethnic group all across the Central Pacific. And of course the first one was generally accepted to be uh, from Samoa out to the Marquesas. And then the Marquesas, if you've seen pictures of them, and sadly I haven't been there, they have practically they have no reefs, they have mostly valleys and cliffs, not much arable land area and so a lot of them up there said they wanted out <laughs> and so families sailed back and founded uh, the Society Islands here, Tahiti, sailed north and uh, uh, found Hawaii and so the Marquesas were a big source of uh, immigration, migration, whatever and the last group of course they went down to Aotearoa which we call of course New Zealand. So let's uh, move along here. All right, this is your typical voyaging canoe, which uh, they built some sort of a little grass shack on it so they could get some, some shelter from the uh, elements. And of course, what this canoe could do, it was almost unique in history at the time, was it could sail to windward, like you can tack to windward. And if you can tack to windward, then you can start out from point A and go to point B across a large ocean. But if you have to run before the wind, and I'll get into that later, then it's a whole different uh, uh, breed of cats. And I suspect it was fairly easy to find the Sandwich Islands because we had four active volcanoes at the time. And this is uh, Herb Kane's painting of a Polynesian voyaging canoe uh, coming uh, uh, towards the shore to inspect all these goings on. The last migration was to Aotearoa, or uh, New Zealand. And it's sort of interesting, uh, uh, we grew up, those of us who grew up here got very used to pidgin English. But I went down to New Zealand and I walked out in the cow pasture one day and there was a cowboy tending the herd and I went up to ask him a question and he was obviously almost pure Maori stock and he answered in the most perfect British English I've ever heard. And so the whole point is the, the English people who arrived in New Zealand set up the educational system and everybody who went to school there learned to speak that way. But in Hawaii, the sugar industry brought in the Japanese, the Chinese, the Portuguese, the Puerto Ricans, the Filipinos, and you had to come up with a lingua franca where all these ethnic groups could communicate. And Hawaiian-style pidgin, I suspect, is what grew out of all that. But New Zealand's uh, ethnic history is totally different because there were only two groups involved. Well then, of course, this was the traditional Hawaiian village where you had the Aupua'a, which went from the sea to the mountains. And of course, that would give you access to fishing, and then you could have in the coastal plain, and Tahiti, by the way, has very little coastal plains compared to Hawaii. You could have taro patches and other agricultural operations, and then you had access to all the, the uh, food products and such that you found up in the rainforest. And so this is your classic Hawaiian village in the pre-Cook era. And of course, you depended on fishing an awful lot, especially along the Kona coast, which was pretty dry and had limited access to water compared to other parts of Hawaii. And of course, here's just another general fishing shot. These are all pictures by Herb Kane, and Herb has written me a letter and given me full permission to use them any way I see fit, which is nice. A uh, little more on Herb Kane later. But uh, there's Mauna Loa, of course, with Pu'uvava, cinder cone over there on the left. And of course, uh, 
Uh, this, as you're going to hear from this, this, the history of Spanish navigation in the Pacific, they had an official route that went by at 13, officially 13 north latitude. South Point is 19 north, and there is simply no way that these kind of ships could have done that for 240 years without uh, seeing a volcanic eruption. There were four active volcanoes in Hawaii during that period. Don't forget the Hualalai and Haleakala, 1790. And so here's a Manila a galleon coming up to see what all this smoke in the sky is all about. Okay, then of course uh, uh, the we have inner island commerce here, and this is a typical uh, uh, twin hull canoe, which was probably pretty popular for going inner island, especially if Oahu and Kauai were involved. And of course, in 1778, uh, Captain Cook arrived, and here is Herb Kane's painting of him off uh, uh, Kialakakua. And uh, that had quite a royal welcoming party, apparently. And Herb Kane makes a real effort to be technically accurate. That's why I appreciate him so much. And, of course, this was during the Makahiki, or the, the time of peace, when he first arrived. And I guess this was the, the Admiral's barge coming out or something like that. But there is, of course, the site of the Captain Cook's monument in the background there, of course, when this was painted to re reflect his first arrival. And this is Herb Kane seeing the death of Captain Cook. And uh, before he painted this picture, he contacted the U of H and asked for a calculation of the, that date and time when it occurred, what was sea level. And so this painting has been specifically painted to match the exact sea level conditions when this occurred. And of course, the Big Island, the sea is about two feet higher now on the Big Island because the weight of Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa are slowly pushing Mauna, the island into the Earth's mantle. Well, uh, Kamehameha was a young chief at that occasion, and uh, I suspect he was in the back row taking notes, and he says, you know, uh, uh, these guys have an interesting little uh, fighting tool called firearms. But this is a, it was a typical battle, a sea battle, prior to the use of uh, firearms. And uh, so this is, again, a Herb Kane shot, pretty dramatic. Kamehameha's first big objective was to bring all of Hawaii under his rule. And so in the pre-Kamehameha, you had chiefs uh, in Waipio and Kona and, I suppose, Puna and all the rest. And uh, Captain, or I should say, Kamehameha constructed this heiau to celebrate his take, complete takeover of the island of Hawaii. It's now a national monument, uh, a long walk inland from Kauai High Harbor. Okay, now we come to the Battle of the Red Mouth Gun. Uh, this was, uh, they captured the Fair American after the Fair American had not uh, behaved in a gentlemanly like manner. And so they decided to put it out of its misery and Kamehameha's forces inherited it one way or the other. And uh, then uh, this is a fight off either Waipio or Waimano Valley on the Hamakua coast. And you will notice the canoe in the foregrounds are both equipped with uh, small, bow small bore cannons, as was the Fair American. And so again, this was the Battle of the Red Mouth Gun. And then from there, Kamehameha went to Maui and conquered Maui, as you can see here, a battle out there in the, uh, in the below the peaks of the West Maui mountain range. And uh, then, of course, moving on, Inner Island, and you'll notice that Kamehameha's war canoes uh, now sport what are probably a pair of three-inch guns. And, uh, of course, this is the overthrow of, 19, uh, of 1795, where uh, Kamehameha captured the island of Oahu. He then planned to go after Kauai. Uh, however, his army got sick, uh, probably cholera or something like that, and he had to call it off. But the chief of Kauai uh, figured he was reading the handwriting on the wall, and so he made a deal with Kamehameha. He says, all right, let's assume that you uh, are now the boss here on Kauai, but if you leave me your local chief in charge as long as I'm alive, no problem. And Kamehameha said, well, sounds like a good deal to me, so that's how he completed his uh, uh, bringing all the islands under together under one rule. And uh, for many years, a center of government was Kailua Kona, and this part of Kona is pretty much the same as you see it today. 
interesting thing. Uh, it was be, it would have been about eight, eighteen, nineteen. Uh, the, the Kamehameha dynasty handed down a decision turning off the old kapu, the old religions. The old religions were literally banned by the government of Hawaii about 1819. And like six months later, the New England Congregational Missionaries arrived and they sailed into an intellectual vacuum. And they were, so they were extremely successful in establishing the Christian religion in Hawaii. And here is Princess Kapiolani reading the Bible during an eruption at Hale Mau Mau. And this would have been absolutely verboten under the old Kapu laws. But she is demonstrating here that there is a new regime in place. Of course, what the missionaries did, they wanted to teach the Bible to the Hawaiians, and so they had to make a decision, command decision. We're going to, are we going to teach them English so they can read the King James Version? Or they decided it would be better to create a written language for the first time. So the Congregational written Missionaries did develop the full-bore Hawaiian written language for the first time in history. And then they were simultaneously translating the Bible and training local teachers, ministers, and they did through they were extremely successful this is the little church there at Kapo on Maui and uh, by 1850 the three most literate parts of the world were Scotland New England and Hawaii so the missionaries did quite a job well then the new industry arrived the first industry the first thing that financed Hawaii's entry into world commerce was the sandalwood trade but I'm afraid they pretty much wiped out the sandalwood reserves and uh, so the new industry was whaling and of course uh, Lahaina was a major whaling port and so Herb's Kane, Herb, Herb Kane's picture uh, shows this as the next evolution and then I went to on a trip uh, I signed up with the British Ramblers Association for a hiking tour in Austria and at the little town of Altbach well one day the guide says tomorrow we're going up the Grattle Spitz and he says you're going up the Grattle Spitz see you at dinner so we took the train to Innsbruck and ended up in this little low budget museum on the other side of the tracks in Innsbruck and up on the second floor was this interesting globe of the world the Peter Anish globe dated 1746 and I'm looking at this thing it's a real neat globe hey wait a minute uh, this lawyer in Hawaii, Wendell Carl Smith, had written an article in the paper a year or so earlier about Spanish navigation in the Pacific. And uh, I wonder, uh, uh, wonder if this globe's got it. So I had to get down on the floor because it was all set up for European visitors. And sure enough, at exactly the same north latitude as the island of Cuba, and by the way, if you're looking at old charts, Cuba overlies the Hawaiian archipelago perfectly as to latitude. So pick up the island of Cuba, slide it around the globe, and you can check if that group of islands is probably Hawaii. And it passed the test here. And it was south of where Alaska should have been, which wasn't showing on the globe, of course. Los Ilis de Mojes. Hey, that's the Spanish name that Wendell Carl Smith's article made reference to. I just discovered something. So because I discovered this globe, I decided to uh, do a little research on the subject and put together this program. Why did all this happen? Well, right after Columbus discovered the Western Hemisphere, uh, Pope, Pope Alexander VI, in order to keep peace in his uh, Catholic family, decided he'd better draw a line between Portugal and Spain because, remember, Vasco da Gama, etc., had rounded the Cape of Good Hope, and they had, the Portuguese were in the process of establishing little colonies and trading posts along the coasts of India and China. So he drew a vertical line down the map here of the Atlantic, about 150 leagues west of the Cape Verdes, and and, the, and said anywhere east of that is Portugal's Kuliana, anywhere to the west is Spanish area of responsibility. A year later, both the Portuguese and the Spanish agreed that that line wasn't really in the best place, so they had a, held a treaty and moved it 300 liter, uh, meter uh, leagues uh, west of the Cape Verdes to a longitude that here's, is probably pretty close to this longitude, that treaty line right there, see. They didn't know it at the time, but what that did, it went through what today is Brazil. 
And that is why today Brazil has a Portuguese tradition, that their language is Portuguese, and all the rest of South America is Spanish because of that 18, uh, 19, 1494 treaty uh, that divided the, the world between Spain and Portugal. And the Portuguese lucked out, and nobody knew it, and they got Brazil in the package. This is a sort of a preview of Captain Cook's chart. Of course, he got the latest uh, cartography information, and on his chart, he plots the Sandwich Islands exactly where they are, and he also, the, the cartographer, put Los Ilos de Mojes right here, which of course is the, uh, the our islands as noted by the Spanish navigators. And why is the Spanish plot over there? Well, for 240 years, the Spanish shipped Mexican silver out of Acapulco and went across to Manila Bay to trade with the Chinese. More on that later. But uh, as you will see shortly, uh, before the days of the Harrison chronometer, you, there was no way to estimate ocean currents. I'm getting ahead of the story. So here is the uh, a page from Herb Kane's book, The Voyagers. I was sitting in my office one day and the phone rang and this voice said, are you Alan Lloyd? And I said, oh yes. And he says, are you the guy that wrote the article in the Hawaiian Electric Newsletter about that globe in Austria and Innsbruck? And I said, yeah, that's me. And uh, he said, I really enjoyed your article. It's exactly the same as in my book, The Voyagers, I'm Herb Kane. So Herb called me. That sort of made my day. <laughs> and uh, I made a point to go over and meet him and we have been preaching the same song ever since on the subject of this presentation. National Geographic came out with the same sort of information and as you saw from Herb's previous page, here's the same map right here. And this is the official trading route. Well, in uh, 1527, actually the King of Spain ordered Hernando Cortez to establish a trading route with the Orient across the Pacific because uh, uh, with that treaty there's no way Spain could get to the riches of the Orient. And so uh, uh, Admiral Saavedra sailed from Zaculta about 18 north in uh, 1527 due west across the Pacific and about a month out they ran into a big cone of storm he had his own galleon and two pinnaces and the two pinnaces disappeared during the storm and were never seen again and one of the, the officers aboard Admiral Saavedra's galleon noted in his log in the teeth of the storm after the captain had been knocked out by a lurch from a big wave, uh, he observed briefly mountains to the north through the storm. And that's the first vague reference to there's some islands out there west of Mexico. The uh, Portuguese had all moved in along the uh, uh, coast of uh, China. Well, let me go back on that one. Had all moved in and established all their trading uh, areas along the coast of China and also up to Japan. And in fact, uh, there's apparently a letter in the records of the East India Trading Company of some sort of a correspondence with uh, the, uh, the Englishman on the, the Dutch ship that ran aground off Japan and the movie Shogun was about him. Anjan San, remember him? Well, he was a real guy. I forget his uh, English name escapes me at the moment. But uh, he did actually have correspondence with the uh, East India Company. So the whole point is, how is Spain going to trade with the Orient? Well, they had a little negotiating meeting with the Portuguese and said, you guys can have Manila Bay or the Philippines because there's no gold in the Philippines. And so the Spain the Spanish said, we'll take it. And the Chinese merchant says, they no big things to you in Manila. <laughs> and so that's why uh, the Philippines developed a uh, Spanish tradition. They eventually ended up building their actual galleons in Manila of local timber. But for 240 years, the Manila galleon trade shipped Mexican silver out of Acapulco to Manila and to trade with the Orient in Manila. These were the wealthiest treasure ships in history. They, at that time, silver was worth three times more in Manila than it was in Spain. 
uh, I guess for local mine reasons. And uh, so generally the Spanish would ship the Inca gold to Europe directly on the Atocha and other galleons. And they would ship the silver, with exceptions of course, to the Orient to trade with the Chinese. And all the silks and the crockery and the spices would then go back across the North Pacific. And so here we have the uh, ship being loaded. The ship has now delivered its silver, and they're now loading it with cargo for Mexico and Europe. And, of course, that's a lot less dense. The silver ingots made a nice ballast in a relatively empty ship coming out. But going home, they stuffed every nook and cranny with cargo because it didn't weigh very much. And the Spanish had one technological advantage over the British. They stored their water in earthenware casks, or jugs, earthenware jugs, instead of wooden casks. And for that reason, uh, they could stay at sea longer than a British frigate. And in this case, in order to make more room in the hold, they would actually strap the water jugs to the rigging, as you can see right there. The water doesn't spoil. Yeah, in contact with the wood, the water doesn't last very long. So these uh, galleons would then sail north. Well, they go back through the Sibuyan Sea and San Bernardino Strait, which at that time was called the Embocadero. And then they would, um, I got ahead of, uh, the big problem was that these galleons, being square riggers, didn't go to windward worth a darn. And so they had to find a route with favorable winds and currents. And so it took Friar Erdineta sailing with Legaspi in uh, uh, 1565, sailed uh, from Mexico. He sailed down to 13 degrees because he duplicated the trading routes in the Atlantic. He, re he reasoned that the wind currents would be about the same. And they, so they would sail out of Acapulco for the Embocadero, which is, again, San Bernardino Strait, and then work their way up to Manila, running before the trade winds. And that's where the name comes from. And then they would load up in Manila, and they would try to do this during the... Uh, uh, they try to do this during the winter months so they would not have to worry about hurricanes. And so generally they would sail out, of, they would uh, leave Acapulco around uh, oh, October or something, get to leave Manila around February or March. They would sail north to the latitude of Japan, run before the westerlies back across the Pacific, and then they would come work their way down the uh, coast to Acapulco. And the run to Manila was three or four months, which was usually a piece of cake. The run coming back was miserable. Usually a quarter of the crew would die of a disease, etc. And there was one case of a Manila galleon that refused to respond to signals off the Mexican coast. They sent a boat out. All 400 of the people on board had died. So anyway, they would unload at Acapulco, then they would transship by mule over to Veracruz, and then from there back to uh, just across the Atlantic to Spain. So for 240 years, that's the way Spain traded with the Orient. Now, I got a chance to meet Mel Fisher, the guy who discovered the Atocha off Florida, the Spanish treasure ship, and I had one question for Mel. I said, did the Atocha have any Manila cargo? He said, no, she originated in Panama. She was full of Inca gold. But he said her sailing consort was the Marguerita, which was lost in the same storm, and, was, uh, and we recovered her cargo, and she had lots of Manila cargo on board. So the Marguerita, sailing out of Veracruz, was part of the system, uh, bringing the goods of the Orient to Spain. Here is the general route. In, here's the Embocadero. That's, uh, I believe, that's 13 North. You run right across the uh, 13 North, and you would come down in here, sail through the Sibuyan Sea, and up here to Manila Bay. <coughs> and then on the way home, most of them would go back this way, but some of them decided to go up around this way. And in 1666, they established Guam as a refueling stop, if you will. And so the uh, Guam has a Spanish tradition. 
and they would all try to put in there, especially on the way back, to top off the tanks, so to speak, for water and whatever, before they attempted the long run across the North Pacific. Okay. Commodore Anson heard about all this, decided to go out and capture himself a Manila Galleon, which were the wealthiest treasure ships in history. So he sailed around Cape Horn and came up to uh, the vicinity of Acapulco, and he got spotted. So no, no Galleons came out. So he gave, gave up. He sailed across the Pacific and hove to off Samar, near San Bernardino Strait. And sure enough, here came the Manila Galleon, the Calandonga, and he attacked and captured her. And she had, I think, uh, about 100 and uh, somewhere on here, it gives her cargo, but it's like 130, no, 132,000 ounces of silver and uh, also silver coin. No, this was 32,000. Uh, anyway, the number escapes me, but she was heavily loaded both with silver ingots and silver coin. But she had a, another very valuable item on board. The first time an Englishman has captured the, an official chart of the Manila Galleon trade. This was a big military secret in Spain, as you can imagine. The vessels would start here at Acapulco, and, and the Great Circle route in that day, of course, would have to be following latitude. See, the Spanish were very good at measuring north and south latitude. They had absolutely no way to measure east or west longitude. So what they would do, they would sail down to the latitude of their destination, and they would sail right along that latitude all the way to the Philippines. And, of course, they could do that by a sight on Polaris or taking a sight on noonday sight on the sun. And they were quite good at maintaining their latitude. Okay, this is the same map continued all the way to the west. And here, of course, you have the Marianas. And uh, by orders of the King of Spain, bonfires were burned every night all during the, the, the Manila Galleon season. So they would have a refueling stop on the way to the Embocadero. Here is Samar, and there is the uh, uh, San Bernardino Strait. And so that was the official trading route, as is shown on the Cavendonga's chart. And here you can see a little more detail coming out of Acapulco. But what have we got here? La de Graciada, La Mesa, and Los Mejos. Those were very common names assigned to this group of islands a little bit north of the Spanish official trading route, and it's certainly quite possible that uh, a few of them drifted a little bit north, and you definitely want to know about these islands up there, because it would ruin your whole day if you st sailed into the uh, Puna coast in the middle of the night and didn't know it was there. And La Perouse, as I will mention later, was very interested in the fact that on most of the charts, the southern island was named La Mesa. Anybody know why? Mauna Loa looks like a big Spanish mesa. World's most massive mountain, flat top, just like mesas are supposed to be. Okay, a whole bunch of maps came out with Los Islas de Mojes spread all over them. This one, I think, was around 1516. Let's see, this one, uh, this one was from a Venetian cartographer. And uh, if you look out there, you can see that, yeah, there they are, right there, just, just south of the Tropic of Cancer, which is 2320 north. There's uh, the La Mesa group. Looking a little closer now, like very common names. Los uh, Mejos, La Vizina, La De Graciada. That one was usually assigned to Maui, but this cartographer sort of got him crossed. I don't think the locals called him that. <laughs> so anyway, here's another shot. This is the Theodore Bry shot, and uh, or map, I should say. Here is the John Blau chart, and again on both of these charts. There they are right there, always at the correct north latitude, always about a thousand miles too far east. Here's another one. Uh, again, you can see them right here. There they are right there, just south of the Tropic of Cancer. Okay, here we're getting into a French chart. Yeah, this one is dated up to uh, uh, 1711, and 
and the French chart has got them right here. There they are, right there. And they've got the Baja California pretty well laid out at the same latitude it is. And, of course, Acapulco down here. Okay, here we've got another one. I'll get up a little closer now. This is a little newer now. Here we have Captain Cook's uh, voyage right here, Endeavor and Re Revolution. And there's a French frigate involved here also. And so you notice these dates are <coughs> just following Cook. Now, in those days, the... Uh, yeah, the... the uh, uh, the political thing to do when you found a new island or a new significant discovery was to name it after your big boss. And so Captain Cook's big boss at the time was the first Lord of the Admiralty, the Earl of Sandwich. And so we became the Sandwich Islands. And all during the 1800s, on the charts, we were the Sandwich Islands. Then in 1900, uh, when the Congress declared we were the territory of Hawaii, uh, then all of a sudden the name Hawaii began appearing on the charts. And of course, here's Los Mo Mojes, La Mesa, La de Graciada, over there at their normal position. Again, always at precisely the same latitude, and always too far east. Now, the way you would navigate in those days on the Spanish ships is you would uh, take your noon shot, get your latitude, throw the log over the stern, that's where the term comes from, and <clears throat> let the line run out th through the quartermaster's fingers as they inverted the 27 second hourglass. And when the hourglass ran out, the quartermaster would call out to the officer, two and a half knot, two and a, two and a half knots, senor, and that's where the term knots comes from, the knots on the line going out to the log, out the stern of the ship. And this was called navigation by a count. And so you simply add up your estimates for every day, and of course no way could you spot any ocean currents. And so here we've got a, another Frenchman, including Cook and Vancouver. And again, you see the familiar pattern there. Looking in closer, again, we have this French chart now, Hawaii and Los Mojes over there. Again, getting back to Cook's chart. Again, he shows both of them. Looking in closer, <clears throat> you can see Cook is... Cook's uh, east-west longitude for Hilo Bay is absolutely perfect. And here is the La Perouse chart. And I had a lot of fun with this one. <clears throat> now, La Perouse, and by the way, his English translation journal is at the uh, museum down there at Mission House Museum. And I, I had, was able to go down and go through his accounts, and I found La Perouse agreed with me, so that made my day. But anyway, <laughs> on La Perouse's chart, he has the longitude for Hawaii, for Pearl Harbor, at 160 degrees. Well, Pearl Harbor is actually 158, according to James Cook and according to modern charts. Now, wait a minute. Here, La Perouse is a modern navigator. How come uh, he's off by two degrees? And then I kept looking at this chart and looking at this chart. Does anybody here can read French? What's that say right along there? Well, it is uh, something like Longitude Oeste de Meridian de Paris. Now, in 50, 1790, no respecting Frenchman is going to use Greenwich as a prime meridian. So all the French charts use the observatory in Paris as the prime meridian. And there's two degrees difference between Paris and Greenwich. So, yeah, yeah, there it is. Pretty good. <laughs> I love to discover things like that. And here's a uh, just a, a blow up again of the same chart. You can see, uh, in fact, if you can read French, uh, right on his chart, La Perouse puts in that uh, it is obviously that uh, Los Ilas de Mojes and uh, La Mesa and Hawaii are the same group. Because he told one of his navigators he came north from Easter Island and then made the run along the 20th parallel. And he had one of his navigators navigating by uh, chronometers, by the the uh, 
modern navigation and the other by account. And right off the bat, they picked up the North Equatorial Current. Well, incidentally, you know where the term French Frigate Shoal comes from? La Perouse Dam there ran aground there. Literally. You see where he went by through French Frigate Shoal there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, here's the bottom line. Here's the currents. The... Uh, Japanese and Alaskan current, the California current, comes down here and becomes the North Equatorial current. This is one hell of a current. When they, when they towed the battleship Missouri out here way back when, they intentionally went south to ride the current out to Pearl Harbor because at a six-knot tow, a solid one knot is a significant percentage. And so uh, the Manila galleons were all had the break of this current and they didn't know it. And this is one of the world's major currents right here, the North Equatorial Current. And uh, it's uh, a perfect fit. And here's La Mesa, world's most massive mountain, Mauna Loa. And uh, obviously I took this shot myself, uh, flight over to the Big Island. And uh, this, of course, is, is generally has been the world's most active volcano. And heck, guys, there's no way that you could have missed this bugger <laughs> during that period. There's Hula Lai poking out over there. That was active in 1801 and before, and of course, 1790 on Maui. The, that eruption formed, interestingly, La Perouse Bay. And just another shot flying by Mauna Kea, looking over at Mauna Loa. Again, it's pretty, uh, pretty prominent geographical landmarks for early navigators. And, of course, with four active volcanoes lighting up the sky at night and columns of smoke during the day, all that Manila Galleon has to be is a few degrees north of its normal course, and there's no way he could have missed it. And there's another little piece of evidence. There is a band that goes all the way across the Pacific Ocean from, uh, uh, from Mexico all the way over to Taiwan between the Tropic of Cancer and 20 North. In the entire Pacific, there is only one group of islands in, in that band, and that's the Hawaiian Islands. And so the Spanish were good on latitude. And here's Cook's chart. Again, his longitude for Manila, I mean for Hilo Bay is perfect. How was Cook able to do this? You know, he's two years out. Well, yeah, he's got the Harrison chronometer on his second and third voyage. But on his first voyage, when he discovered New Ze rediscovered New Zealand, his longitude for New Zealand is right to within a quarter of a degree. Well, how did he do it without a clock, a wristwatch, well, or a chronometer? They packed along a big grandfather's clock. And they'd unpack it and take it ashore, set it up. See, there's the grandfather's clock right there. You can see it under the tent. And uh, then they go take a noon shot and set the grandfather's clock for the noon shot. And then three officers and a... a uh, uh, clerk would go ashore and the clerk would sit in front of the clock and say one two three read and one guy would take an elevation on the sun another on the moon and a third the angle between the two and that's called taking a lunar and then some poor midshipman would crawl off in the corner with all the log tables and with a laborious calculation calculate GMT for that observation and as soon as you got GMT you've got your longitude and that's how Cook did it on his first voyage and that's how he reset his clocks on his second and third voyage by taking regular lunars as did his sailing master who was really a very good navigator William Bly and this second and third is what I understand and uh, oh, this uh, is sort of about almost my last slide this is down at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel and on two occasions when they painted the Royal Hawaiian, yours truly went in and pounded on somebody's desk and says, don't paint over this. This is right opposite the elevators as you check in at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. And this is why I like it. Right down in the corner it says, the islands of Hawaii were probably first discovered by the Spaniard Gaetano in 1555. But their existence was kept a close secret by Spain. It's also recorded the two ships of Saavedra were shipwrecked here in 1528. Because uh, old Hawaiian legend says in the, the uh, reign of, the, of King Umi, a lifeboat came ashore in South Kona with a bunch of howlies in it. 
and uh, they married into the population and that they never never got back to Europe. The Spanish Naval Museum a couple of years ago reported that they credit uh, Bernardo de la Torre was the first European to report the existence of the Sandwich Islands back to Europe in 1548. So they uh, picked somebody ahead of Gaetana, but either one will do for me. And of course, Captain James Cook on his third and last voyage rediscovered, that's the right word by the way, rediscovered the Sandwich Islands or Hawaii in February 1778 and correctly charted their position, matter of fact. He christened them for his patron, Lord Sandwich, First Lord of the Admiralty. He was killed by the natives on, in February 79 at Kealakakua Bay. So that completes my little message of navigation around the Pacific. And... Uh, Herb Kane sent me this nice little note. He said, another voyager into our history, wishing you fair winds and following seas. Make aloha pomihana, Herb Kane. Okay, that's it. <laughs>